What's up, my wizards? It's Deb from SBMTG on the YouTube.com. Down there, we like magic, and today I got something special for you. A lot of you tell me all the time that you're interested in playing the modern format, but you don't have like thousand dollars for a competitive modern deck. Sometimes even more than that. So don't worry, son. Got you back today. I'm gonna give you three good budget modern decks that are all only about sixty dollars a piece. Pretty sweet deal. A couple of quick things. First, in the interest of time, I won't be talking about sideboards in the video, but not to worry, you can always look in the description. You'll get the full deck list, including the sideboard for all three of these decks. And there's going to be links in the description too for other modern decks I've done, like Soul Sisters or Red Green Land Destruction is going to be in there. So check the description for all kinds of goodies. And if you enjoy the content, make sure you hit thumbs up. Puts the video in more people's recommended feeds, and that helps me out a lot. So I'd appreciate it if you did that, but let's get on to the decks here. Now, all three decks today are all somewhat established already as decent budget modern decks that are known for producing some amount of resistance. Results. And in the interest of giving you a diversity of deck list here to choose from, because not everybody likes the same thing, I'm going to do three completely different decks today. One a combo deck, one an aggro deck, and one a mid-range deck. We'll start with the combo deck, Peely Pala Combo. Not only is Peely Pala really fun to say, but this is also one of the cheapest ways you can build an infinite combo in modern. And yeah, modern has its fair share of infinite combos, but again, if you're not looking to spend much money, Peely Pala is probably the way to go. So let me show you the deck. Now this deck wins off of a two-card combo, Peely Pala and Grand Architect. Obviously, you have both of these out. Then you can make the Peely Pala blue to start things off, first of all, and then just gain infinite mana by untapping and tapping the Peely Pala over and over. But how do we finish the opponent off once we've got infinite mana? Well, the deck just plays one of its big win conditions here, one Pyromatics and one Blue Sun's Zenith. Well, any X spell would technically work where Pyromatics is here, but you can at least add insult to injury and blow your opponent's entire board up. That's nice, too. But we can more or less just, you know, infinite mana, we can hit them for their entire life total with a Pyromatics. And with Blue Sun Zenith, we can essentially draw them out. Well, almost the entire rest of the deck is going to be tutors and card draw so that we can get our combo and put it into place as quickly as possible. So to that end, let's play some transmute cards. We're going to play four copies of Muddle the Mixture and four copies of Drift of Phantasms. Well, both of these are nice in that either one of them can go get either a combo piece or a win condition, you know? Muddle the Mixture can go get either Peely Pala or Pyromatics to finish the game off once you do have the combo. And then Drift of Phantasms can go get your Grand Architect to complete the combo, or Blue Sun Zenith to, again, close the game out. And, you know, they're both castable occasionally, but you'll almost never actually hard cast these cards. They are mostly just for tutoring. We're going to play four copies of Azure Mage in the deck as well, because once we have infinite mana, we can essentially draw our whole library with this card, you know? We have infinite mana, so it doesn't matter that it, the cost of activation here is relatively steep. We can activate it as many times as we want and literally draw until we have no cards in our deck if that's what we feel like doing, and that's always fun. This will, of course, ensure that you find whatever piece you need to close out the game, so Azure Mage is just kind of the best thing that we could play here. We're going to play four copies of Serum Visions, four copies of Sleight of Hand, and two copies of Anticipate here. Well, Serum Visions and Sleight of Hand are actually somewhat expensive, especially Sleight of Hand. It's like $354 $4 a piece now on TCG Player, and it's worth it. Trust me, you may have the uh, inclination to add Anticipates to the deck. It doesn't completely throw everything off, but Sleight of Hand is just a much, much, much better card in this deck. We want as many things that cost one mana so that we can go ahead on our very first turn and start digging for these combo pieces. And to finish off the main deck here, we're going to play some counter spells, mostly against other counter spells. We don't want to get our combo disrupted, and being able to counter counters is the best way of doing that. So we're going to play three copies of Swan Song and three copies of a brand new card, Sensor. A Swan Song's obviously great. For just one mana, we can counter whatever counter spells being currently thrown at us, unless the counter spell in question is uncounterable. <laughs> Not too many of those. So it's just a one mana way out of getting countered and ultimately losing the game. <laughs> For just one mana, we'll do that. We don't care that we're giving them a 2 2 flyer literally at all. That's fine. They can have that. It's just one mana to win the game <laughs> a lot of the time against against blue decks. Um, and then Sensor isn't quite as good as Swan Song, but it's more um, versatile. You know, we're looking to dig for this combo, so the ability to just pay one mana and draw a card is really, really valuable. And sometimes when they go to counter one of our combo pieces, we can go ahead and censor it, and there's really not much they can do about it if they're tapped all the way down. 
As far as the lands go in this deck, this land base, just like the other two decks today, is fairly simple. And this is the actually the only deck that plays a non-basic land, Halimar Depths. As far as pros and cons for this specific deck here, it can protect itself fairly well. Even though the combo is relatively fragile, we still have some main board ways, and especially post board ways, of protecting it, which is nice. There's also lots and lots of ways to tutor and draw cards. There's eight tutors and like 17 things that draw cards in the decks in the deck. And sometimes, you know, obviously we can just auto win on turn four. That's a pretty exciting pro. But of course, there are some cons. You know, it's a combo deck, so it's not going to be very interactive at all. You know, if your opponent's trying to do stuff, we really have no way of stopping that stuff most of the time. So we're not resilient either. If our combo does get disrupted for whatever reason, then the only way that we have of getting the combo back is to draw into more copies of it. So we're not very resilient. And the deck is not entirely upgradable. This is not the absolute best version of the deck that exists, but there's not really much you can do to it outside of this list. But final thoughts on the deck are that infinite combos are always fun. This one is fairly straightforward. It's got all the ways in the world to go get its combo pieces if it doesn't currently have them. It's just this deck is more or less combo 101. Especially if you've never played a combo deck, it's got a two card combo instead of a three or four card combo. That's always nice. It goes infinite. That's super sweet. It's got eight tutors and a bunch of things that draw cards. That's something that combo decks really need. And it's got ways of protecting itself. So it's just got everything that makes a combo combo deck good, and that's nice. Now the second deck that I want to talk about today can also win on like turn four fairly easily some of the time, but this one's an aggro deck and it's really all in, you know, and there's a bunch of different budget choices to choose from when it comes to modern aggro decks, you know, but Goblins is played out and actually not that budget anymore, you know, you've got mono white humans and stuff like that, but for my money the most fun budget aggro modern deck is definitely Elves. This deck is pretty straightforward, we're going to play Elves more or less it. There's 36 of them in the deck, as a matter of fact. We're going to play a bunch of one-drop elves and a bunch of lords. We're going to play almost every lord printed for elves at this point in magic history, and we're just going to look to have a huge board presence by turn four and swing in with a bunch of, like, 4-4 four, four elves. It's totally possible. So let's take a look at the deck. We're going to play a bunch of one-drop elves that generate mana here. There's a lot of them in print, so let's play some of them. We're going to play four copies of Lana or elves, four copies of Elvish Mystic, and four copies of Arbor Elf, which is like a sort of honorary Lana War or Elvish Mystic. Well, all three of these can lead to us having three mana on board by turn two, and so we can cast a Lord, because most of our Lords cost three mana. Ten of them cost three mana. That's a lot of Lords. We actually have so many one-drops that I'm not done talking about them. There's 16 in all in the deck, and the other four are all Yoraga Warcaller, which is our first sort of Lord effect here. You will not often play this on turn one. In fact, if you play it on turn one, you're most likely doing it wrong. What you want to do is kick this for at least one, which can be done as early as turn two if you played any of those elves we just looked at on turn one. But sometimes you can kick it for two or even three, and then your all of your elves will get enormous. This is a great top deck late game when you have all the mana in the world. Because we're playing a bunch of mana elves, you can sometimes kick this for like five fairly easily in the late game. So this can make all of your elves enormous or still be decent as early as turn two. As far as the other lords, go ahead and tell you about those. We're going to play four copies of Elvis Champion, four copies of Elvis Archdruid, and two copies of Imperious Perfect in the deck. All of these are three mana lords, you see that, and they all have their various advantages. You know, Imperious Perfect can help us go even wider than we already go. That's nice, especially considering we run out of cards relatively quickly in our hand, and Imperious Perfect can make those lands where those turns where we just draw a land into profitable turns. We still get a guy, and that's nice. And sometimes we have a bunch of lord effects out and stuff, then she can just pump out like five fives. <laughs> which is really, really sweet. Um, Elvish Archdruid can just make a butt ton of mana all at once. There are times where Archdruid can be tapping for like 8 to 10 mana, which is really, really dope, especially with Yuraga Warcaller. I've already talked about that card, so that's cool. And it's also a Lord in and of itself. And then Elvish Champion is obviously super sweet against green decks that also play forests. But we've actually got a card in this deck that turns an opponent's land into a forest, allowing us to just get through completely unblocked if we got a champion on the field. So that is 10 different Lords, not counting Yuraga Warcaller, and another pseudo Lord that we're playing. So you really wanted to get down to, to semantics here, we're playing like 16 different Lord effects. Our elves are getting huge. Let's peel it back a little bit and talk about a couple of two drops. We're going to play four copies of Dwinan's Elite and four copies of Elvish Visionary. 
Well, both of these are more or less no-brainers. You know, Dwayne's Elite can help us go a little bit wider, and we've got like 16 ways of getting an elf on the battlefield turn one, so it's very easy to get that turn two token out of a Dwayne's Elite. And it's a pretty good, um, you know, late-game top deck, too. It's always going to bring another elf with it most of the time. And again, with all the Lord effects, that elf that it brings with it can sometimes be a 5-5. Five -five. So it's pretty sweet for just two mana. And Elvish Visionary, you know, it's not great if we don't have Lords out or anything, but it's pretty important to draw a card because most of the time, we're just going to be drawing another elf that we can drop. And again, if it's in the mid or late game and we've got some lords out, this can rep that drawn card can represent another 5-5 five, five creature for just one or two mana. So, of this visionary, very important. But at the top of the curve, in the final creature we're going to play in the deck, we're going to do two copies of Azuri Renegade Leader because of course we are, you know? It's just an overrun effect for all of our elves. Plus three, plus three, and trample? That's a game-winning effect that we can sometimes activate more than once in a turn, which is really, really sweet, especially with something like Elvish Archdruid, which in the later game can, again, just tap for eight or ten mana. Just tapping one Archdruid can often pay, pay the activation cost for an Azuri, so... Very, very easy to pump all your elves at least the one time, if not more, and get through for lethal. Now, believe it or not, even though we're playing 36 elves in the deck, we're still going to make some room for some spells here. We're going to play three copies of Lead the Stampede and three copies of Nylea's Presence. Now, Lead the Stampede can often just draw a grip full of elves. You know, there are times where this is going to seriously draw you four elves, and it will often draw you at least two. You know, that'll be on unlucky draws. It'll net card advantage for three mana, which is pretty sweet, especially if you've got all the mana in the world. Three mana is not bad, and you'll often have extra mana left over to cast whatever you get with it. And after sweepers, this can help us get back on board really, really easily. And then Nylea's presence, not only also will draw us a card, that's pretty dope, but it will also, if we have an Elvis champion on the battlefield, allow us to just get through unblocked, no questions asked. So that's pretty dirty. We're going to do it. Now, if you weren't counting, this may surprise you, but that leaves room for just 18 basic forests as our land base here, but don't worry, again, we've got 12 different one-drop elves that generate mana, not to mention Archdruid, so we've got the mana. <laughs> Do not worry about it. We're more or less running like 26 lands in this deck. Now, as far as the pros and cons for this deck, first of all, it is very, very fast. This deck is blindingly fast. It'll drop a Lord on turn two and then sometimes another one on turn three along with a second creature and just get on board incredibly fast. So the deck is blindingly lightning fast, and that's pretty sweet. And it's extremely consistent, you know. We've got 12 one-drop guys that generate mana. We've got, like, I don't even know how many Lords. <laughs> it's crazy, 16 different Lords in the deck, so... So the deck achieves its game plan literally every single game. It's extremely consistent in what it's trying to do. As far as cons go, though, the deck is obviously very weak to sweepers, even with lead by example, to help us recover. The deck is still just incredibly very, very weak <laughs> to uh, sweepers, and not entirely resilient at that, that to that end. And it's got zero defense. Like, it's not interested in um, being interactive whatsoever. If your opponent's trying to do something, really, again, just like the first deck, not a whole lot we can do about it. We're just trying to do what we want to do. Final thoughts on this deck are that if you like turning your guys sideways, this is a great deck for you. You know, 36 creatures is probably more than any aggro deck in the entire format plays, including things like goblins that play a bunch of creatures, but that deck also plays some burn and stuff. If you just want to play a creature literally every single turn of the game and swing it sideways, Elves is for you. And it's honestly got more synergy than most other tribal decks because, again, you got a few lords out, suddenly your one or two, you know, power elves are like five fives. That's just ridiculous. And once it starts snowballing, your opponent can't do anything about it unless they can sweep you. If they can't, they're done. But our final deck today is a mid-range deck, and this one, for my money, might be the most fun of all three of the decks, and probably the most upgradable, too. So, let's take a look at Mono Black Panharmonicon. This deck is awesome. Well, first of all, a playset of Panharmonicon, because we absolutely need it. You know, the whole deck is built around this card, and even though the deck can function without it, the deck gets much, much better with a Panharmonicon out. Now, the deck mostly plays creatures, and all of them have some sort of ETB effect that can either you know, kill creatures or disrupt the opponent in some way. And to that end, we'll start with four copies of Ravenous Rats, four copies of Brain Maggot, and two copies of Chittering Rats. Now, all of these can come down and disrupt an opponent in the early game, get some cards out of their hand, put a body on the battlefield to block, and get us a little bit later into the game. All of those things are great, and after we have a Panharmonicon out, these things get really, really annoying. You know, getting two cards with any of these is really super awesome value. 
We're going to play four copies of Gatekeeper of Malakir, which will often not be a two-drop. We want to kick this, if at all possible. And it's great, even if we don't have a Panharmonicon out, it's still a dead creature on the other side of the board. That's nice. But if we have a Panharmonicon out, the card gets really, really dirty, which is an ongoing theme in this deck. But once you're making him sacrifice two guys and you get a guy, that is a really, really good card advantage. So Gatekeeper of Malakir gets absolutely bloody insane once you do have a Panharmonicon. Speaking of, something else that's really good even without Panharmonicon, but gets dumb when you have one, that's a running theme in the deck. We're going to play three copies of Giralf's Messenger, which is a slightly expensive card, but definitely worth playing the three of. And if you have extra money, go ahead and make it a four of. I just wanted to keep the deck around 60 bucks, but the card is incredibly good. <laughs> you know, it's a creature that's hard to get rid of, very, very resilient, add some resiliency to the deck. And obviously, if you do have a Panharmonicon out, then every time it comes into play, the opponent gets zapped for four or, which they cannot, that cannot happen a whole lot of times or they'll just die. Now up until recently this deck played a couple of different four drops as like one or two ofs, but because of some recent cards, I feel like it's best to change that and just play two copies of Gonti, Lord of Luxury. Another card that's really, really good, even without hip Panharmonicon. And in Modern, you can cast all kinds of fun stuff off of a Gonti. But if you do have a Panharmonicon out, getting this trigger twice is absolutely stupid. And Gonti's a pretty good equalizer. We're playing $60 decks, but if they want to play $40 cards in their deck, we'll just play those cards for them. We're going to play four copies of Shriek Maw. I sound like a broken record, but this is fine, even without Panharmonicon. And even if you don't pay five for it, just paying two mana for a terror has always been a pretty decent deal. So Shriek Maw is good at almost any stage of the game, whether you're playing him early to get rid of a threat on the other side of the board, you're playing him late, you know? You can get a, a decently sized 3-2 fear guy that gets rid of a dude, or you can kill two guys if you have a Panharmonicon. And you can do that on curve. Panharmonicon turn two, or turn four, and then turn five Shriek Maw, not the worst play ever. But one of the best creatures in the deck, my old buddy, and one of the best reasons to play Panharmonicon. We're going to play four copies of Grey Merchant of Asphodel, How I Have Missed You. Well, Gary was one of my favorite cards back when Pharaoh's block, block was in standard, you know. And no different here, you know. Once we have a Panharmonicon out, and again, keep in mind, we can do this on curve. And we can drop Gary and hit for like 10, 12, 14, 16 even sometimes. It's absolutely crazy. And he's obviously a stupidly good top deck, even later on in the game. You know, if you can make it to turn five with a Panharmonicon out, then Grey Merchant can just come down and completely change the game. You can tell I'm excited about this card because we get to play it again. And I really, really have always liked this card and being able to play it alongside Panharmonicon is hilarious. But we've actually got one more creature up our sleeve here. That's the two copies of Grave Titan. The most expensive card in the deck, yes, but wouldn't be caught dead not playing it. This is the ultimate example of a creature that's good without Panharmonicon. But if we do have a Panharmonicon, look how much power we're putting on the board all at one time when this guy enters the battlefield. It's just absolutely disgusting. But even if you don't have a Panharmonicon, old GT can still come down and like finish the game. Like he's just really, really awesome. And to finish off the deck here, our only non-creature, non-Panharmonicon card, we're going to play two copies of Phyrexian Arena in the deck. And if you wanted to bring the budget down even more, you could play like Underworld Connections, but Arena is just the much better card and it's not really that much more expensive than Connections. So we just want to draw an extra card every turn. That can sometimes be really great, especially if we flooded, you know, extra drawn cards is great. We can find a Panharmonicon. If we've already got a Panharmonicon Sometimes we can draw into two different creatures with ETB abilities in the same turn. That's just, all of that is great. So we want our Howling Mind, even if it costs us a life a turn. We do not care. It is really important to dig in this deck. And finally, the land base, just, you know, 25 swamps. Totally fine. You can play, like, Mortuary Mire in this deck if you wanted to, but I think swamps is fine. We're trying to curve out for the most part, you know. We could play Mire on turn one, but at that point, it's useless. It's worse than swamp. At that point. So if you wanted to sandwich in Mortuary Mire or any other, you know, deck more salvage, I don't know what you're doing. I mean, if you wanted to do that, you could. But I'm just going to stick with the cheap 25 swamps here. Now, as far as the pros and cons of this deck, this deck can disrupt combo and control decks with its 10 different things that make them discard cards in the early game. That's pretty sweet. And against control, we've got stuff like Giralf's Messenger. That's dope. We're good against mid range and even aggro sometimes because of Gatekeeper and Shriek Maw keeping stuff off the board early, and once we get to Grey Merchant, we gain all the life back we've already lost a lot of the time, so we're a pretty stable deck that's really good against specifically combo and control decks because of all of our discard effects, and we're one of the only decks, actually today the only deck, 
um, <laughs> of these three that has any sort of removal or interaction of any kind, you know, so if you're the kind of player that just has to interact with your opponent, then this is a good deck for that. And it's really, really, really fun when you have a Panharmonicon out. I think I've already mentioned that. But as far as the cons go, it's nowhere near as fun when you don't have a Panharmonicon out. <laughs> There's, that's a con right there. It's only sort of subpar if you never draw a Panharmonicon, so keep that in mind. It's also somewhat weak in the early game, especially against, you know, that like that aggro deck that I just showed you, the Mono Green Elves deck. We don't really have a whole lot of defense against that deck in the early game. You know, we've got Gatekeeper, we've got Shriek Maw, and we've got stuff to make them discard cards, but they'll still get to go relatively wide, and there's not a whole lot of answers that we have for a deck that strikes very, very fast. You know, things like Ravenous Rats just don't stack up to really, really great on-curve creatures, so we can get run over by aggro decks. I'm tapped out for this one. That's all I've got for now. Let me know which of these decks you like the most down there in the comments section. Let me know how you'd upgrade them, given the chance, you know, what do we not play? What should we play? All that kind of stuff, you know. Always interested in how you'd tweak these decks, and I'm always interested in how you did with them, you know. Try these out. Let me know how you felt about them. Did one of them stick with you? Who knows, you know. You could buy all three of these decks right now for less than the cost of your average competitive standard deck. So, you know, that's a pretty good investment, especially considering modern never rotates, you know. You just buy one of these decks for the same cost as, like, a new video game, and you could play the deck for literally forever. So, decent investments here, too. But anyway, that's it for now. Make sure that you subscribe if you're new and you want more content like this. We put out deck decks all the time. Hit that bell little bell icon next to subscribe that makes sure that your phone will tell you when you get when I put out a new video It'll be like hey it's strictly better put out a new video You'll be like oh sweet dev new video uh, so make sure you do that stuff. You can also check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash sbmtg if you want to support the channel at all. And you can check me out on Twitter at sbmtgdev. Make sure you like the video. YouTube spill over. I will see you cats later. Thanks for watching, my wizards.